Um, hey everybody, uh, thank you for being here. I'm really excited to talk to you. And I'm gonna get started just by introducing myself. Um, my name is Max, and I'm a developer, and I'm an artist. And my day job is that I'm like a user experience engineer. And that basically means that um, I'm an engineer and I build things, but it's always very directly informed by the way that the user perceives it and by the effect that it has on them and their perceptions. Um, I also really love websites. Uh, particularly websites that are maybe like useless or weird. Um, I just think those are kind of like the most fun thing that uh, you can build on a computer. Um, so I'm talking to you today about uh, like sand simulations and also about building interactive um, experiences with WebAssembly. And I have to level with you before we start that this talk is a little bit of like a Trojan horror situation. So. Um, I lured you all into these stands with the promise of information about exciting emerging web technology like WebAssembly, but I'm really just gonna talk to you about my favorite thing, which are falling sand games. Um, so I hope that's not a problem. Um, so if you haven't heard of falling sand games, they are kind of this whole genre of um, web game, there's like free flash applet kind of things. And the way they work is that you've got a palette of like, pixelated elements that you can paint onto the screen, and they all behave according to different kind of like physical uh, phenomena. So there's fire and water, and you get to paint with them, and then they interact with each other, and cool things happen. Um, they share a lot in common with cellular autonomy and things like Conway's Game of Life. And in particular, they have the same um, kind of really cool um, behavior where you have very simple rules, and when you let those play out, you get really amazing, complex, emergent behavior. Um, and it can be really surprising to even the person maybe who set up those rules, and certainly the person watching them play out, because you could never expect exactly what you would get just based on reading that it does this in these conditions or that. It's much more complex. Um, another thing I really love about sand games is that um, they really like have a very low fidelity visual representation of what's happening on screen. Like you have a couple colored pixels, um, maybe they're moving around a little bit, but there's such little there to go off that it really lets your imagination run wild and interpret what you're seeing with its own um, uh, like layer over what's going on. And so you see something much more vivid in your mind's eye than what's going on on screen, and there's a lot of room to play with that, and I think that's really fun. Um, something people oftentimes ask when they see one of these games is like, how do you win this game? Um, and there is no win condition or score or anything like that. The way these games work is that you're making your own objectives as you play, and that's part of the game. Um, and so oftentimes that means understanding what's going on in front of you. So maybe you're trying to figure out um, how a new element works or how it interacts with another one. You might make a hypothesis about what will happen and then make an experiment and test it out and see what happens. Um, or maybe you will be like telling yourself a story and playing it out with the elements in front of you um, and seeing what happens and imagining it in your mind and um, so on. And so I think they're really, it's a really wonderful mode of play and it's one where you're not only the player, but you're also kind of a storyteller for yourself, and you're almost kind of like a game maker for yourself, because you're using this toy and playing with it the way that you want to play with it. Um, so my favorite Falling Sand game has been around for a long time, and it's danball.jp. It's called The Powder Game. Um, and it kind of has uh, this really interesting feature, which is that when you make things in it, right in the game, um, in the menu, you can upload them and they go to a server and other people can browse them and see them. And it's kind of got this like, long-standing, weird, and thriving community of people building interesting things and uploading them for each other. And it's really cool to see, given like, just these small tools, the kind of things people make for each other to play with. Um, so you've got like, your bog standard is thousands and thousands of volcanoes. Uh, you know, it's like an infinite fourth grade science fair of different volcanoes people make. But volcanoes are cool. I can see why they want to make a lot of volcanoes. 
Um, people make different like destructible structures so you can load it into your um, browser and then have fun setting it on fire or pouring acid on it. Um, and that's like a fun way to play with somebody who you've never met. Um, a, but people get really creative. Like there's all kinds of games people make out of the simple elements they have, including things like mood rings. And so you can see that this one says like, it's very clear that it will not be accurate of your mood unless you first vote. Uh, there's lots of like vote pandering in these communities. It's a, it's a staple of uh, how they communicate. But this is a cool game that somebody made inside of another game. Um, my personal favorite type of sand game upload is this entire genre called Don't Smoke, um, where it, it kind of displays to you the anatomical phenomenons that will occur if you smoke a cigarette. Uh, in this case, the lava will like travel up your brain stem and explode your brain. Um, so these games are really awesome, and you can see why I was fascinated with them like for my entire childhood. Um, and so as I got a little older, and when I first learned to program, as soon as I could like rub two for loops together, I knew that what I wanted to build was like a falling sand game. Um, but you know, it would be the best one ever, obviously. But um, so I knew a little bit of JavaScript, and I knew how to use a Canvas API, and I started trying to look at other Falling Sand games and understand how they were working and what the um, elements were doing when they were moving around. And when I was re-implementing them, I found that they're really simple. Um, and with just a couple like very low numbers of hundreds of lines of JavaScript, um, I suddenly had like water moving around the screen. And I was really excited. And I was having so much fun, but I, I realized that as I kept adding new elements to the game, it was getting slower and slower. And I didn't have a very firm grasp on concepts such as like functions or having your code in more than one file. And the way that was manifesting is that as I was adding more features into this big glob of code, everything was getting uh, more and more buggy and it was taking longer. And so you can see this blob on the right-hand side of the screen is an element that was just a mistake I made that I decided to domesticate and keep in the game as the glitch element because I thought it was cool. But I wanted to keep building this, but it was getting kind of untenable, and I couldn't understand what was going on anymore. Um, and so I was like, OK, I know what I have to do. I have to refactor this code somehow and make it good. I didn't know what, exactly what that meant, but I knew I needed it to be in different files. So I had to set up Webpack so I could have different files in my JavaScript project. And then this is the last commit I ever made to the project in 2015. Set it up to use Webpack for my impending refactor, which never, never happened. I think this is kind of a common story. Um, so. Some time went by, and I got a cat. Uh, I moved to California. But um, other things were going on in my life, but I was still kind of thinking about sand games. And I was also noticing a lot of really cool projects that were happening that were letting people build and code in the browser and um, kind of make program one element of a larger system. And I thought those were really cool. Um, and so. I had this idea that I got really excited about last year, which is what if there was a falling sand game where people could code their own elements and upload them, and then all those elements coded by different people could interact, and there could be reactions that nobody ever anticipated, and something could happen. Um, so I kind of knew that I needed a different architecture diagram for my game than just having everything in one file and one blob. Like, if people were going to be writing code to plug into here, there would need to be some sort of separation into like an engine and then maybe the different elements. Um, and I was maybe inspired by things like React, and I thought that, OK, there can be a, a, an API that they talk over, and there can be the framework and then the components. Um, but I also knew that if I wanted people to actually code and upload their elements, it would need to be like a pleasant and easy experience, and I would need to handle as many of the edge cases as I could for them. Um, and so I was really, so I started to prototype this, and I was really trying at all times to move as much of the gross logic out of the elements and make them as easy and fun to make, and make the engine, if that had to be gross, that was fine. Um, so I was really happy with this prototype, um, and I was having so much fun building elements in it. Like, it was just me building them, but I was having a great time, and I thought this, I wanted to keep doing it and wanted to show people, but I was building it in Lua, and if I know anything about um, if you want someone to use your thing, it's kind of got to be on the web as far as I'm concerned, and so I wanted to start over and build it um, so that I could actually share it with people. Um, so that kind of turned into Sandspiel, and you can play it online at sandspiel.club. 
Um, the rest of my talk is kind of boring, so if you want to do that for the next 10 minutes, like, I'm not going to judge you. Um, so I'll, but I'll give you a quick demo so you can kind of see what it looks like. Um, so I'll press play. You've got your different elements. Um, I'll plant like some flowers. Um, and then I think that inevitably in Sandsfield, people tend to just like set everything on fire. But it's OK. It doesn't release any carbon. Um, so that's kind of what the game looks like. And you can see there's this um, canvas where the simulation is happening. And then there's also the buttons in the UI. Um, so, the, one of the things that I um, found when I was building um, Sandspiel that turned out to be really critical and really helped me build it was um, I decided to try to use WebAssembly. And so there is actually WebAssembly content in this talk. I'm sorry. Um, and uh, I've said that word a couple times now. Maybe you've heard it uh, this week, but um, just to, like, Rehash. WebAssembly is not really a language. It's a like instruction format that you compile other languages to, um, and it has some properties that people are kind of excited about. Um, so first of all, is that um, it's fast. So I'm not going to go into detail here because this is kind of an, any kind of performance conversation is a nuanced conversation, but particularly um, it is you can it, you have a lot of it's very predictable what the performance will be with JavaScript. You can make it fast, but you are relying on the way that it gets optimized. and You need to write it in a very careful way. Um, whereas with WebAssembly, there's um, much less moving pieces. And if you write it a certain way, you'll know it'll be fast on everybody's browser. Um, another important aspect of WebAssembly is that it's sandboxed. So it is safe in WebAssembly to run code written by someone who you don't necessarily trust on your machine or even on your user's machine sometimes. Um, and it's not going to like, steal their passwords necessarily, because it's, it's sandbox that can't reach into the rest of the system like some native code can. Um, I thought this was going to be a really important thing for my game, because I thought I was going to be running people's like, code they wrote and running on other people's computers. Um, but it turns out I never actually got to that part. Um, that was a little ambitious. But maybe in the future, this will come in handy. But just the other factors of WebAssembly were still really useful to me. Um, and so lastly, I just want to let people know that it really is ready to use. Um, I was kind of surprised with this myself, but um, you know, like four major browsers and some other ones as well have already implemented it. Um, it works also like on mobile really well. And I was, I'm surprised by how fast it's moving, and I think that part of it is that the spec is very pragmatic, and it's very informed by what browsers already have as far as infrastructure. and. Um, there's a lot of buy-in for it, and so it's very rapidly becoming something you can ship. Um, and I had no problems with compatibility, surprisingly, uh, with WebAssembly. Um, one more thing about it being ready to use is that the tooling is, um, at least in my experience, was really good. Um, so I wrote some Rust code for a Sandspiel that was compiled to WebAssembly. And the entire tool chain that I used to do that, um, including some tools like WASMPack and WASMBindGen, which let you um, respectively um, compile Rust code into a WebAssembly file and also a JavaScript file that kind of loads it. And then WASMBindGen is a tool for kind of calling in between from WebAssembly and, and JavaScript. Um, these tools are. Um, they're still like in beta, but they're really nice to use. And there's a lot of shared um, culture and like shared communication norms between the JavaScript community and like the Rust and WebAssembly community. So if you have expectations about how a library should work and how the documentation should be and like what kind of error messages should give you that you are used to from writing JavaScript, um, and you go try to write um, Rust and WebAssembly, you're not going to be like shocked and horrified um, because it's a lot of the same people and they take they have the same um, expectations you do of how, what a good user interface is for a tool. Um, so this was really great, and I really appreciated being able to use this. Um, another really critical thing about, that I want to tell you about the way that you can use WebAssembly is that you don't have to like, write your whole application in it, and then it just happens to run in the browser, but it's really just a big hunk of Rust or something. Um, my app is about 50% JavaScript and about 50% Rust or WebAssembly. Um, and this was awesome because I got to put the things that needed to run many, many, many times a second um, and be really fast. I got to write that in Rust and make it fast. And then all the things that don't need to be fast because it's just like, 
you know, building the user interface or triggering a network request. Um, all those things I got to write in JavaScript and benefit A, from just the fact that JavaScript is really good at doing these things, and B, that I got to use the whole ecosystem of React and different tools made this really awesome. And if I had tried to write the whole thing in Rust, it would have taken me a lot longer because I would have been like, there's no really good tools right now for building interfaces yet, uh, not like the way there are in JavaScript. Um, and so being able to split my concerns here was really awesome. So I think you can kind of imagine like the, the JavaScript code here is mostly just you know, React code like you may have seen before. Um, and the way it interacts with the code that I wrote in Rust is that essentially there is a JavaScript like class that has some functions. And those happen to be backed by WebAssembly. But from the perspective of the JavaScript, you're just calling JavaScript functions. And so I can do things like I have a paint method which will draw a circle onto the screen in a certain element at a certain radius, or I have one to reset the canvas or to calculate one tick of the simulation. And so from the JavaScript perspective, you're really just calling some methods, and it happens to be implemented in WebAssembly and be fast. And that's thanks to some of these tools that I mentioned before, like Res and BindGen. Um, so as for the, what the WebAssembly code looks like, um, this tick method, which runs one frame of the simulation, I'll kind of show how it works. It's pretty simple. Um, and this is, by the way, what powers um, this part of the game where the pixels are moving around and interacting. So essentially, uh, I have a data structure which is just like a big two-dimensional array of all the data for my different um, cells of the grid. And it goes through, loops through each one in order. And when it gets to each one, it runs an update function based on whatever the type is of the um, grid cell. And so you get to the third one. And it's a sand grid. It's a, a piece of sand. So it matches to the sand update function. And the sand update function is really simple. It's really just like an if-else statement. Um, and the way that that works is that it looks at its local coordinate system. And so it says, OK, what's the cell below me? What's, that, what's the type of that? If it's empty, then I can fall down. And I'll just go down there. And I'll erase myself and write myself one pixel lower. Um, alternatively, if that first check failed and maybe there's like a piece of stone underneath you, then it goes to the second statement and it checks one of the diagonals and tries to fall there um, and does the same thing. So that's all there is to this algorithm that lets you do the sand. And kind of the trick here is that it's happening um, on every pixel of the grid and it's happening at 60 frames per second. And it starts to look like how you would imagine sand would work. Um, so there is like 18 other elements. Um, and there's, some of them are a little more complicated, but they all have the same pattern of they're a single function. They call some APIs to read their neighbors and to write to their neighbors. And then you get different behavior. Um, so uh, I mentioned this earlier, but it really was like the key to being able to make this project quickly, the fact that I could put things in WebAssembly that needed to be fast, and I could implement everything else in JavaScript and use the ecosystem and not have to worry about all the type checking and all of the like, other um, conditions that Rust enforces on your code that can sometimes slow you down. Um, and so um, another thing, I mentioned that there's network code. And the network code is that I actually also built a, um, like an upload and download functionality like in the sand game that I really liked. Um, and so this has been like the most gratifying part of the project. So a lot of, it's pretty much middle schoolers, but a lot of middle schoolers play this game and they draw really amazing things. Like they kind of actually ignore the fact that there's a simulation attached and just use it like MS Paint. But I guess it's like not blocked in their school or their computer lab. So that's maybe why they use it. Um, but they draw really awesome stuff and it's really fun to see what they do. Um, and I think that like maybe one of the, um, so, so the most popular, there's like an upvoting system, and the most liked and loved post on Sandspiel of all time is this puppy Duna Luna. Um, I can't explain it, but I also love Duna Luna. Um, so there's all kinds of fan art and people remixing Duna Luna and drawing her in different situations. Um, on the right, that's Super Duna Luna, the tall one. Um, and um, I guess that one difference between um, Sandspiel and the Powder Game is that in the Powder Game, there was a rule against loading somebody else's submission and re-uploading it or modifying it. And Sandspiel doesn't enforce that. We kind of like encourage forking. And I think that's what leads to some of this fun, like, Duna Luna stuff. 
Um, unfortunately, I mentioned that the best part of the project has been seeing the things people upload. Uh, so that's also been definitely the worst part of the project. So not everybody is nice, and um, there's like, I moderate the, post, the, the website every morning, and waking up to it is not always fun. Um, sometimes I feel like this person, where I feel like these people are ruining the game, and I wish they, it had never been created, so none of it would happen. Um, and so I do do some manual moderation, but um, it's really not sustainable, and I'm not sure what to do. And so I've kind of like looked to where I look for to solve problems when I have programming problems, and they've not been useful. Like, um, there's no algorithm for making people be nice to for making people be nice to each other on the internet. Um, not even like string matching algorithms work. I tried, um, and like, nor do other places where who have usually solved my like tough programming problems like CSS tricks. They have no button style that will make people be nice to each other. Um, unfortunately, so this is a problem I still have. I haven't solved it, um, and. I know that there's other people who have problems like this, and I'm definitely curious to hear what they did, or if they're just like, there's all this invisible work that's happening behind the scenes that makes it look like things are nice. Um, so I'd definitely be interested to talk if you think you know a solution. Just like, please do not tell me to use a neural network. Thank you. Um, so uh, please do. I think we have a break after this, so please play with Sandspiel if you, you know, want to kill some time and chill out. Um, and I have a longer form blog post um, that goes into a little bit more of the inspiration for the game and some of the design decisions, and also into some of the technical details, because I glossed over some things. Um, and thank you so much. <laughs>